This video is part of an audio series featuring the book The Future is Faster Than You Think by Diamandis and Kotler. For more audiobooks, visit my YouTube channel or website for downloads. The Future is Faster Than You Think by Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kotler. Chapter 1 Convergence Flying Cars the Skirball Cultural Center sits just off the 405 freeway on the northern edge of Los Angeles. Built atop the thin spine of the Santa Monica Mountains, the center offers spectacular views in nearly every direction, except for the freeway below, which is bumper to bumper for miles on end. Of course it is. In 2018, for the sixth straight year, Los Angeles earned the dubious honor of being the most gridlocked metropolis in the world where the average driver spends two and a half working weeks a year, trapped in traffic. Yet help may be on its way. In May of 2018, the Skirball Center was ground zero for Uber Elevate, the ride-sharing company's radical plan for solving this traffic, their second annual flying car conference. Inside the Skirball, giant screens displayed the night sky, dotted with stars that slowly faded into a blue sky, dotted with clouds. Beneath the clouds, it was standing room only. The event had attracted a motley crew of the power elite. CEOs, entrepreneurs, architects, designers, technologists, venture capitalists, government officials, and real estate magnates. Nearly a thousand in total, dressed in everything from Wall Street slick to eternally casual Friday, all gathered to witness the birth of a new industry. To kick off the conference, Jeff Holden, Uber's chief product officer took the stage. With curly brown hair and a gray Uber Air polo shirt, Holden had a boyish demeanor that belied his actual role in the affair. This event, in fact, the entire concept of getting Uber off the ground was Holden's vision. And it was quite a vision. We've come to accept extreme congestion as part of our lives, said Holden. In the United States, we have the honor of being home to 10 of the world's 25 most congested cities, costing us approximately $300 billion in lost income and productivity. Uber's mission is to solve urban mobility. Our goal is to introduce an entirely new form of transportation to the world, namely urban aviation, or what I prefer to call aerial ride-sharing. Aerial ride-sharing might sound like a sci-fi cliché, but Holden had a solid track record of disruptive innovation. In the late 1990s, he followed Jeff Bezos from New York to Seattle to become one of the earliest employees at Amazon. There, he was put in charge of implementing the then zany idea of free two-day shipping for a flat annual membership fee. It was an innovation that many thought would bankrupt the company. Instead, Amazon Prime was born, and today, 100 million Prime Laters member, Prime Laters member, that zany idea accounts for a significant portion of the company's bottom line. Next, Holden went to another startup, Groupon, which is hard to remember as a disruptive enterprise today, but was then part of the first wave of power to the people internet companies. From there, he went to Uber, where despite the turmoil the company experienced, Holden strung together a series of unlikely wins. Uber Pool, Uber Eats, and the most recently, Uber's self-driving car program. So when he proposed an even zanier product line that Uber take to the skies, it wasn't all surprising that the company's leadership took him seriously. And for good reason. The theme of the second annual Uber Elevate wasn't actually flying cars. The cars have already arrived. Instead, the theme of the second Uber Elevate was the path to scale. And a more critical point, that path is a lot shorter than many suspect. By mid-2019, over $1 billion had been invested in at least 25 different flying car companies. A dozen vehicles are currently being test-flown, while another dozen are at stages ranging from PowerPoint to prototype. They come in all shapes and sizes, from motorcycles stacked atop oversized fans, to quadcopter drones scaled up to human size, to miniature space pod airplanes. Larry Page, co-founder and CEO of Alphabet, Google's parent company, was among the first to recognize their potential, personally funding three companies, Z Aero, Opener, 
and Kitty Hawk. Established players like Boeing, Airbus, Embraer, and Bell Helicopter, now just called Bell, a reference to the future di disappearance of the helicopter itself, are also in the game. Thus, for the first time in history, we are past the point of talking about the possibility of flying cars. Those cars are here. Uber's goal, explained Holden from the stage, is to demonstrate flying car capability in 2020 and have aerial ride sharing fully operational in Dallas and LA by 2023. But then Holden went even further. Ultimately, we want to make it economically irrational to own and use a car. How irrational? Let's look at the numbers. Today, the marginal cost of car ownership, that is, not the purchase price, but everything that goes with a car, such as gas, repairs, insurance, parking, etc., is 59 cents per passenger mile. For comparison, a helicopter, which has many more problems than just costs, covers a mile for about $8.93. For its 2020 launch, according to Holden, Uber Air wants to reduce that per mile price to $5.73, then rapidly drive it down to $1.84. But Uber's long-term target is the game changer, $0.44 cents per mile, or cheaper than the cost of driving. And you get a lot per mile. Uber's main interest is in electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, or eVTOLs for short. eVTOLs are being developed by a plethora of companies, but Uber has very particular needs. For an eVTOL to qualify for their aerial ride-sharing program, it must be able to carry one pilot and four passengers at a speed of over 150 miles per hour for three continuous hours of operation. While Uber envisions 25 miles as its shortest flight, think Malibu to downtown LA, these requirements allow you to leap from northern San Diego to southern San Francisco in a single bound. Uber already has five partners who have committed to delivering eVTOLs that meet these specs, with another five or ten still to come. But the vehicles alone won't make car ownership irrational. Uber has also partnered with NASA and the FAA to develop an air traffic management system to coordinate their flying fleet. They've also teamed up with architects, designers, and real estate developers to design, to design a string of mega skyports needed for passengers to load and unload and for vehicles to take off and land. Just like with the flying cars, Uber doesn't want to own these, sky, these skyports, they want to lease them. Once again, they have a very specific need. To qualify as Uber ready, a mega skyport must be able to recharge vehicles in 7 to 15 minutes, handle 1,000 takeoffs and landings per hour for 4,000 passengers, and occupy no more than 3 acres of land, which is small enough to sit atop old parking garages or on the roof of a skyscraper. Put this all together, and by 2027 or so, you'll be able to order up an aerial rideshare as easily as you do an Uber today. And by 2030, Urban aviation could be a major mode of getting from A to B. But all of this raises a fundamental question. Why now? Why, in the late spring of 2018, are flying cars suddenly ready for prime time? What is it about this particular moment in history that has turned one of our oldest science fiction fantasies into our latest reality? After all, we've been dreaming of Blade Runner hover cars and Back to the Future DeLorean DMC-12s for millennia. Vehicles capable of flight date back to the Flying Chariots in the Ramayana, an 11th century Hindu text. Even more modern incarnations, that is, ones built around the internal combustion engine, have been around for a while. The 1917 Curtis Autoplane, the 1937 Aerobile, the 1946 Airphibian, the list goes on. There are uh, over a hundred different patents on file in the U.S. for roadable aircraft. A handful have flown. Most have not. None have delivered on the promise given to us in the Jetsons. In fact, our ire at this lack of delivery has become a, has become a meme unto itself. At the turn of the last century, in a now famous IBM commercial, comedian Avery Brooks asked, It's the year 2000, but where are the flying cars? I was promised flying cars. I don't see any flying cars. 
Why, why, why? In 2011, in his What Happened to the Future manifesto, investor Peter Thiel echoed this concern, writing, We wanted flying cars. Instead, we got 140 characters. Yet, as should be clear by now, the wait is over. The flying cars are here, and the infrastructure is coming fast. While we were sipping our lattes and checking our Instagram, science fiction became science fact. And this brings us back to our initial question. Why now? The answer, in a word, is convergence. Converging technology. If you want to understand convergence, it helps to start at the beginning. In our earlier books, Abundance and Bold, we introduced the notion of exponentially accelerating technology. That is, any technology that doubles in power while dropping in price on a regular basis. Moore's Law is a classic example. In 1965, Intel founder Gordon Moore noticed that the number of transistors on an integrated circuit had been doubling every 18 months. This meant every year and a half, computers got twice as powerful, yet their cost stayed the same. Moore thought this was pretty astounding. He predicted that this trend might last a few more years, maybe five, possibly ten. Well, it's been 20, 40, going on 60 years. Moore's Law is the reason the smartphone in your pocket is a thousand times smaller, a thousand times cheaper, and a million times more powerful than a supercomputer from the 1970s. And it's not slowing down. Despite reports that we are approaching the heat death of Moore's Law, we will which we'll address in the next chapter, in 2023, the average $1,000 laptop will have the same computing power as a human brain, roughly 10 to the 16th cycles per second. 25 years after that, that same average laptop will have the power of all the human brains currently on Earth. More critically, it's not just integrated circuits that are progressing at this rate. In the 1990s, Ray Kurzweil, the director of engineering at Google, and Peter's co-founding partner in Singularity University, discovered that once a technology becomes digital, that is, once it can be programmed in the ones and zeros of computer code, it hops on the back of Moore's law and begins accelerating exponentially. In simple terms, we use our new computers to design even faster new computers, and this creates a positive feedback loop that further accelerates our acceleration, what Kurzweil calls the law of accelerating returns. The technologies now accelerating at this rate include some of the most potent innovations we have yet dreamed up. Quantum computers, artificial intelligence, robotics, nanotechnology, biotechnology, material science, networks, sensors, 3D printing, augmented reality, virtual reality, blockchain, and more. But all of this progress, however radical it may seem, is actually old news. The new news is that formerly independent waves of exponentially accelerating technology are beginning to converge with other independent waves of exponentially accelerating technology. For example, the speed of drug development is accelerating, not only because biotechnology is progressing at an exponential rate, but because artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and a couple other exponentials are converging on the field. In other words, these waves are starting to overlap, stacking atop one another, producing tsunami-sized behemoths that threaten to wash away almost everything in their path. When a new innovation creates a new market and washes away an existing one, we use the term disruptive innovation to describe it. When silicon chips replaced vacuum tubes at the beginning of the digital age, this was a disruptive innovation. Yet, as, technology, as exponential technologies converge, their potential for disruption increases in scale. Solitary exponentials disrupt products, services, and markets, like when Netflix ate Blockbuster for lunch, while convergent exponentials wash away products, services, and markets, as well as the structures that support them. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. The rest of this book is devoted to these forces in their rapid and revolutionary impact. Before we dive deeper into that tale, let's first examine convergence through a more manageable lens, returning to our initial question about flying cars. Why now? 
To answer that, let's examine the three basic requirements any Uber eVTOL will have to meet. Safety, noise, and price. Helicopters, which are the closest model anyone has for a flying car, has been around for nearly 80 years. Igor Sikorsky built the first one in 1939, yet they can't come close to satisfying these requirements. Besides being loud and expensive, they have that bad habit of falling out of the sky. So why are Bell, Uber, Airbus, Boeing, and Embraer, just to name a few, bringing aerial taxis to market today? Once again, convergence. Helicopters are loud and dangerous because they use a single gargantuan rotor to generate lift. Unfortunately, the tip speed of that single rotor produces exactly the right thud 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 frequency to annoy pretty much anybody with ears. And they're dangerous, because if that rotor fails, well, gravity plays for keeps. Now imagine, instead of one main rotor overhead, a bunch of smaller rotors, like a row of small fans beneath a plane's wing, whose combination generates enough lift to fly, but pumps out a lot less noise. Better yet, Imagine if this multi-rotor system could fail gracefully, landing safely even if a couple rotors stopped working at once. Add to this design a single wing that enables speeds of 150 miles per hour or more. All great ideas, except thanks to their terrible power to weight ratios, gasoline powered engines make none of this possible. Enter Distributed Electronic Propul Propulsion, or DEP for short. Over the past decade, a surge in demand for commercial and military drones has pushed roboticists, and drones are just flying robots, to envision a new kind of electromagnetic motor, extremely light, stealthily quiet, and capable of carrying heavy loads. To design that motor, engineers relied on a trilogy of converging techs. First, machine learning advances that allowed them to run enormously complicated flight simulations. Then, materials science breakthroughs that let them create parts both fast enough, both light enough for flying and durable enough for safety. And last, new manufacturing techniques, 3D printing for example, that can create these motors and rotors at any scale. And talk about functionality, these electric engines are 95% efficient compared to gasoline's 28%. But flying a DEP is another story. Adjusting a dozen rotors in microsecond intervals is, be is beyond a human pilot's skill. DEP systems are fly-by-wire, that is, computer-controlled. And what generates, what produces that level of control? Another swarm of converging technologies. First, an AI revolution gave us the computational processing horsepower to take in an ungodly amount of data, make sense of it in microseconds, and to manipulate a multitude of electric motors and aircraft control services accordingly in real time. Second, to sweep in all that data, you need to replace the pilot's eyes and ears with sensors capable of processing gigabits of information at once. That means GPS, LiDAR, radar, an advanced visual imaging suite, and a plethora of microscopic accelerometers, many of which are the dividends of decades of smartphone wars. Finally, you will need batteries. They'll have to last long enough to overcome range anxiety, the fear of running out of juice while running errands, and generate enough oomph, or what engineers call power density, to lift the vehicle, a pilot, and four passengers off the ground. To achieve this lift, the minimum requirement is 350 kilowatt hours per kilogram. This was out of reach until recently. Thanks to the explosive growth of both solar power and electric cars, there's now a bigger need for better energy storage systems, resulting in a next generation of lithium-ion batteries with increased range, and, as an added bonus, enough power to lift flying cars. In the aerial ride-sharing equation, we've solved safety and noise, but price still requires a few more innovations. There's also the not small issue of manufacturing enough EV tolls for Uber's program. To be able to meet Uber's outsized demand at an affordable price would require suppliers to produce aircraft faster than during World War II, when a still unbroken record of 18,000 B-24 fighters were pumped out over two years, or at its peak, one plane every 63 minutes. 
For this to happen, which is what it would take to make flying cars a mainstream reality, not an elitist luxury, we need another trio of convergences. To start, computer-aided design and simulation need to become deft enough to draft the airfoils, wings, and fuselages required for commercial flight. At the same time, materials science has to produce carbon fiber composites and complex metal alloys that are light enough for flight yet durable enough for safety. Finally, 3D printers have to become fast enough to turn these new materials into usable parts so that all previous aircraft manufacturing records are shattered. In other words, exactly where we are today. Sure, you can play this game with any new technology. Socks couldn't be invented until a materials revolution turned plant fibers into soft fabrics and a tool making revolution turned animal bones into sewing needles. This is progress, of course, but linear in nature. It took thousands of years to get from these first steps in sockdom to the next major innovation, the, domestic, the domestication of animals, which gave us the sheep's wool. And thousands more years for electricity to bring sock making to scale. But the blurry acceleration we are witnessing today, that is, the answer to why now, is the result of a dozen different technologies converging. It's progress at a rate that we've not seen before, and this is a problem for us. The human brain evolved in an environment that was local and linear. Local, meaning most everything that we interacted with was less than a day's walk away. And linear, meaning the rate of change was exceptionally slow. Your great-great-great-grandfather's life was roughly the same as his great-great-grandson's life. But we now live in a world that is global and exponential. Global, meaning if it happens on the other side of the planet, we hear about it seconds later, and our computers hear about it only milliseconds later. Exponential, meanwhile, refers to today's blitzkrieg speed of development. Forget about the difference between generations, currently mere months can bring a revolution. Yet our brain, which hasn't really had a hardware update in 200,000 years, wasn't designed for this scale or speed. And if we struggle to track the growth of singular innovations, we are downright helpless in the face of converging ones. Put it this way, in The Law of Accelerating Returns, Ray Kurzweil did the math and found that we are going to experience 20,000 years of technological change over the next 100 years. Essentially, we are going from the birth of agriculture to the birth of the internet twice in the next century. This means paradigm shifting, game changing, nothing is ever the same again breakthroughs, such as affordable ride sharing, will not be an occasional affair. They will be happening all the time. It means, of course, that flying cars are just the beginning more transportation options. Autonomous cars. A little over a century ago, another transportation transformation was underway. The triple threat convergence of the internal combustion engine, the moving assembly line, and the emerging petroleum industry was together driving, pun intended, the horse and buggy business out of business. The first bespoke cars hit the road around the tail end of the 19th century. But Ford's 1908 introduction of the mass-produced Model T marked the real tipping point. Just four years later, New York traffic surveys counted more cars than horses on the road. And while the speed of the shift was breathtaking, in retrospect it wasn't unexpected. Whenever a new technology offers a tenfold increase in value, cheaper, faster, and better, there's little that can slow it down. In the decades that followed Ford's invention, with a Cambrian explosion of accoutrements, the car reshaped our world. Stoplights and stop signs, internet, interstate highways, and multi-level interchanges, parking lots and parking garages, gas stations on every corner, the drive through car washes, suburbs, smog, and gridlock. But even as we witnessed the birth of aerial ride-sharing, which seems likely to replace multiple parts in the system, a different revolution threatens it entirely. Autonomous cars. While the first driverless car was a radio-controlled American wonder that navigated the streets of New York City back in the 1920s, this was little more than an oversized toy. Its 
modern incarnation emerged from the military's desire for a risk-free way to resupply troops. Roboticists began trying to meet this need in the 1980s. Car companies started paying attention in the 90s. Many date the pivotal breakthrough from to 2004, when the Defense Advanced Research Projects Association, DARPA, created a driverless car competition, the DARPA Grand Challenge to turbocharge development. The competition did its job. A decade later, most major car companies, and more than a few major tech companies, had autonomous car programs up and running. By the middle of 2019, dozens of vehicles had logged millions of miles on California roads. Traditional auto automotive players like BMW, Mercedes, and Toyota were competing for this emerging market with tech giants like Apple, Google, Uber, and Tesla, trying out different designs, gathering data, and honing neural networks. Out of these, Waymo, through Google, seems well positioned for early market dominance. Formerly Google's self-driving car project, Waymo began its work in 2009 by hiring Sebastian Thrun, the Stanford professor who won the DARPA Grand Challenge. Thrun helped develop the AI system that would become the brains behind Waymo's self-driving fleet. About 10 years later, in March of 2018, Waymo purchased that fleet, buying 20,000 sporty self-driving Jaguars for its forthcoming ride-hailing service. With this many cars, Waymo intends to deliver a million trips per day in 2020, which might be ambitious, but Uber currently de delivers 15 million rides per day. To understand the importance of this figure or anything close to it, consider that the more miles an autonomous car drivers, the more data it gathers. And data is the gasoline of the driverless world. Since 2009, Waymo's vehicles have logged over 10 million miles. By 2020, with 20,000 Jaguars doing hundreds of thousands of daily trips, they'll be adding an extra million miles or so every day. All of those miles matter. As autonomous vehicles drive, they gather information, positions of traffic signs, road conditions, and the like. More information equals smarter algorithms equals safer cars, and this combination is the very edge needed for market domination. To compete with Waymo, General Motors is making up for lost time with big dollars. In 2018, it poured $1.1 billion into GM Cruise, its self-driving division. A few months later, it took an additional $2.25 billion investment from the Japanese conglomerate SoftBank, just months after SoftBank had taken a 15% position in Uber. With all of this capital flying around, with all these heavy hitters involved, how fast will this transformation occur? Faster than anyone expects, says Jeff Holden, who also founded Uber's AI Lab and Autonomous Car Group. Already, over 10% of millennials have opted for ride-sharing over car ownership, but this is just the beginning. Autonomous cars will be four to five times cheaper. They make owning a car not only unnecessary, but also expensive. My guess, within 10 years, you'll probably need a special permit to drive a human-operated car. For consumers, the benefits of this transformation are many. Most Americans will tolerate a commute of 30 minutes or less, but with a robo chauffeur behind the wheel, in a car that can become anything, a bedroom, a boardroom, a movie theater, you might not mind living farther afield, where low-cost real estate lets you buy more house for less money. Giving up that car allows you to turn your garage into a spare bedroom, your driveway into a rose garden, and you won't need to buy gas again, ever. The cars are electric, and they recharge themselves at night. No more hunting for parking spots or fretting over parking tickets. No speeding tickets either, or drunk driving. As a side note, city revenues could plunge. All of these trends are disruptive in nature, but they pale in comparison to two larger forces for change. First, demonetization, or the removal of cash from the equation. Ride-sharing autonomous cars price out at 80% cheaper than individual car ownership, and they come equipped with a robo chauffeur. Second, saved time. The average U.S. round-trip commute is 50.8 minutes of hair-pulling, mind-numbing drudgery that could be repurposed for sleep, reading, tweeting, sex, whatever your pleasure. For big car manufacturers, 
These developments spell the beginning of an end, especially for those selling car as possession rather than car as service. In 2019, there were a hundred plus aut automotive brands in existence. Over the next 10 years, we can expect auto industry consolidation as exponential technology takes direct aim at Detroit, Germany, and Japan. Car usage rates will be the first driver of this consolidation. Today, the average car owner drives their vehicle less than 5% of the time, and a family of two adults typically has two cars. Thus, a single autonomous car can serve a half dozen families a day. However you work those numbers, this dramatic increase in cooperative efficiency will significantly reduce the need for new car production. Functionality is the second driver. In a ride sharers marketplace, the companies that collect the most data and assemble the biggest fleets are the ones that will offer the lowest wait times and cheapest rides. Cheap and quick are the two biggest factors impacting consumer choice in this kind of market. What brand of car ride sharers are sharing matters a lot less? Most of the time, if the vehicle is clean and neat, consumers won't even notice what brand the car is, similar to how most of us feel about Uber or Lyft today. So if a half a dozen different vehicles are all it takes to please the customer, then a wave of car company extinction is going to follow our wave of car company consolidation. Big Auto won't be the only industry impacted. America has almost half a million parking spaces. In a recent survey, MIT professor of urban planning, Aaron Ben-Joseph, noted that in many major US cities, parking lots cover more than a third of the land area while the nation as a whole has set aside an area larger than Delaware and Rhode Island combined for our vehicles. But if car as service replaces car as a thing you have to park, then we're going to be looking at a huge commercial real estate boom as all these lots get repurposed. Then again, a lot of them could become skyports. Whatever the case, transportation 10 years from now is going to look radically different. And this prediction doesn't include everything that happened after Elon Musk lost his temper. Hyperloop. On an empty swatch of desert outside of Las Vegas, perched atop a high-tech stretch of track, a sleek silver pod begins to quiver. Less than a second later, it's not just moving, it's a hundred mile per hour blur. Ten seconds after, it's zipping down the Virgin Hyperloop 1 development track at 240 miles per hour. If these tracks continued, as they someday will, this high-speed train would take you from Los Angeles to San Francisco in the time it takes to watch a sitcom. Hyperloop is the brainchild of Elon Musk, just one in a series of transportation innovations from a man determined to leave his mark on the industry. In bold, we experienced his first two forays, SpaceX, his rocket company, and Tesla, his electric car company. SpaceX helped revitalize aerospace commercial launches turning a fantasy into a billion dollar industry. Tesla's rapid rise to prominence, meanwhile, shook the major automotive companies out of their electric car apathy. As a result, all have begun phasing out gas guzzlers in favor of fully rechargeable fleets. And both of these companies began to flourish before Musk got irritated. In 2013, in an attempt to shorten the long commute between Los Angeles and San Francisco, the California State Legislature proposed a $68 billion budget allocation on what appeared to be the slowest and most expensive bullet train in history. Musk was outraged. The cost was too high, the train was too sluggish. Teaming up with a group of engineers from Tesla and SpaceX, he published a 58-page concept paper for The Hyperloop, a high-speed transportation network that uses magnetic levitation to propel passenger pods down vacuum tubes at speeds up to 760 miles per hour. If successful, it would zip you across California in 35 minutes, or faster than commercial jets. Musk's idea wasn't entirely new. Sci-fi dreamers have long envisioned high-speed travel through low-pressure tubes. In 1909, rocketry pioneer Robert Goddard proposed a vacuum train concept similar to the Hyperloop. In 1972, the RAND Corporation extended this into a supersonic underground railway. But just like flying cars, turning sci-fi into sci-fact requires a series of convergences. The first of these convergences wasn't technological. 
Rather, it was about the people involved. In January of 2013, Musk and venture capitalist Shervin Peshever were on a humanitarian mission to Cuba when they fell into a discussion about the Hyperloop. Peshever saw possibilities. Musk saw overwhelm. He was irate enough to publish a white paper, but way too busy to start another company. So Peshevar, with Musk's blessing, decided to do it himself. Along with Peter Diamandis, one of the authors, former White House Deputy Chief of, Chief of Staff for Obama, Jim Messina, and tech entrepreneurs Joe Lonsdale and David Sachs as founding board members, Peshevar created Hyperloop One. A couple of years after that, the Virgin Group invested in the idea. Richard Branson was elected chairman, and Virgin Hyperloop One was born. The other required convergences were technological in nature. The Hyperloop exists, says Josh Geigel, the founder, co-founder and chief technology officer for Hyperloop One, because of the rapid acceleration of power electronics, computational modeling, material sciences, and 3D printing. Computational power has increased so much that we can now run Hyperloop simulations on the cloud, testing the whole system for safety and reliability. And manufacturing breakthroughs ranging from the 3D printing of electromagnetic systems to the 3D printing of large concrete structures have changed the game in terms of price and speed. These convergences are why, in various stages of development, there are now 10 major Hyperloop One projects across the globe. Chicago to DC in 35 minutes, Pune to Mumbai in 25 minutes. According to Geigel, Hyperloop is targeting certification in 2023. By 2025, the company plans to have multiple projects under construction and running initial passenger testing. So think about this timetable. Autonomous car rollouts by 2020. Hyperloop certification in aerial ride sharing by 2023. By 2025, going on vacation might have a totally different meaning. Going to work most definitely will. And Musk was just getting started. The Boring Company Elon Musk's main residence in Los Angeles is located in Bel Air, a 17-mile trek from SpaceX's Hawthorne-based offices. On the best of days, his commute takes 35 minutes. But December 17th of 2016, which coincidentally was the anniversary of the first Wright Brothers flight, was not the best of days. The 405 was at a dead stop, and the pileup pushed Musk over the edge. It also gave him time to send out these four tweets. Traffic is driving me nuts. I am going to build a tunnel boring machine and just start digging. It shall be called the Boring Company. <laughs> boring, it's what we do. I am, am actually going to do this. And he did. 18 months later, on January 20th, the anniversary of the Apollo moon landing, Musk tweeted again, Just received verbal government approval for the Boring Company to build an underground New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, D.C. hyperloop. NY to D.C. in 29 minutes. In the spring of 2018, with $113 million of Musk's own money, the Boring Company began boring. They started construction on both ends of the line in D.C. and New York, while also starting on a 10.3-mile Maryland stretch that will eventually connect the two. And while the tunnel is being designed as Hyperloop compatible, meaning it is able to house a Hyperloop, the current plan calls for an interim high-speed train step, where the first trains will travel around 150 miles per hour, which is much less than Musk's proposed 700-plus mile per hour speeds. They've also gotten a contract for building a three-stop subway beneath Las Vegas' sprawling convention center, which they hope to have open for the 2021 Consumer Electronics Show. While not a Hyperloop, the distance is just way too short to bother, it does mark the Boring Company's first paying customer. Finally, while the company has started drilling with conventional machines, Musk has borrowed a page from Tesla's playbook and is now designing electric boring machines that are three times as powerful as the traditional version. It's also worth noting that all of the innovation discussed in this chapter will work in concert. In the minutes before a Hyperloop pod arrives at a boring company drilled station, 
the AI behind Uber's aerial ride-sharing service and the AI behind Waymo's driverless ride-sharing fleet will dispatch a swarm of vehicles to that station in order to take passengers to the next leg of their trip. And if that's not fast enough for you, sometime soon, there might just be another option available. Rockets. LA to Sydney in 30 minutes. As if autonomous cars, flying cars, and high-speed trains weren't enough, in September of 2017, speaking at the International Astronautical Congress in Adelaide, Australia, Musk promised that for the price of an economy airline ticket, his rockets will fly you, quote, anywhere on Earth in under an hour, end quote. Musk delivered this promise at the end of an hour-long keynote to 5,000 aerospace executives and government officials. The presentation was primarily an update about SpaceX's mega-rocket, Starship, which was designed to take humans to Mars. The fact that Musk now wanted to use his interplanetary Starship for terrestrial passenger delivery was the transportation industry equivalent of Steve Jobs' famous line that almost ended his demos, where he said, wait, wait, there's one more thing. The Starship travels at 17,500 miles per hour. It's an order of magnitude faster than the Concorde. Think about what this actually means. New York to Shanghai in 39 minutes. London to Dubai in 29 minutes. Hong Kong to Singapore in 22 minutes. What's not to like? So how real is the Starship? We could probably demonstrate this technology in three years, Musk explained, but it's going to take a while to get the safety right. It's a high bar. Aviation is incredibly safe. You're safer on an airplane than you are at home. That demonstration is proceeding as planned. In September 2017, Musk announced his intentions to retire his current rocket fleet, both the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, and replace him with the Starships in the 2020s. Less than a year later, LA Mayor Eric Garcetti tweeted that SpaceX was planning to break ground on an 18-acre rocket production facility near the port of LA and April of 2019 marked a bigger milestone, the very first test flights of the rocket. Thus, sometime in the next decade or so, off to Europe for lunch may become a standard part of our lexicon. Seeing into the future. It's about to get personal. Before the end of the next decade, this transportation revolution will impact some of the most intimate aspects of our lives, where we choose to live and work, how much free time we have, how we spend that time. It will change how cities look and feel, the size of the local dating pool, the demographics of the local school district. The list goes on and on. Yet try to visualize that on and on. Seriously. Pause this video, close your eyes, and ask yourself a question. How would this transportation transformation change your life? Start small. Consider your day. What errands will you run? What stores will you visit? Are you sure about that? This last question may seem innocuous, but think about it this way. In 2006, retail was booming. Sears was worth $14.3 billion, Target $38.2 billion, and Walmart a whopping $158 billion. Meanwhile, their competitor, an upstart retailer named Amazon, was at $17.5 billion. Now fast forward a decade, what's changed? Hard times hit Main Street. By 2017, Sears had lost 94% of its value, ending the decade worth 0.9 billion, before promptly going out of business. Target did better, finishing up at 55 billion. Walmart did the best, going up 243.9 billion. But Amazon, the everything store, closed out the area worth 700 billion almost 800. And it's, fairly, and it's a fairly safe bet that your life changed as a result. But all that Amazon did to change your life was use a new technology, the internet, to expand upon an old technology, mail order catalogs. The transportation transformation headed our way sits at the convergence of a half dozen exponential technologies and the confluences of a half dozen markets. Not easy to picture all that overlapping impact, is it? It's not easy for any of us. Studies done with fMRI show that when we project ourselves into the future, something peculiar happens. 
the medial prefrontal cortex shuts down. This is a part of the brain that activates when we think about ourselves. When we think about other people, the inverse happens. It deactivates. And when we think about absolute strangers, it deactivates even more. You'd expect that thinking about our future selves would excite the, me the medial prefrontal cortex. Yet the opposite happens. It starts to shut down, meaning that the brain treats the person we're going to become as a stranger. And the farther you project into the future, the more of a stranger you become. If, a few paragraphs back, you took the time to think about how the transportation revolution would impact future you, the you that you were thinking of was literally not you. This is why people have a tough time saving re for retirement, or staying on a diet, or getting regular prostate exams. The brain believes that the person who would benefit from those difficult choices isn't the same one making those choices. This is also why, if you've been reading this chapter and having trouble processing the speed of the change ahead, perhaps fluctuating between saying total BS and holy crap, you're not alone. Couple this with the limitations imposed by our local and linear brains in a global and exponential world, and accurate prediction becomes a considerable problem. Even under normal conditions, these built-in features of our neurobiology make us blind to what's around the bend. But conditions are not close to normal. Not only are a dozen exponential technologies beginning to converge, their impact is unleashing a series of secondary forces. These forces range from our increasing access to information, money, and tools, to our considerable uptick in, producti in productive time and life expectancy. These forces are another tsunami of change, accelerating our acceleration, amping up the speed and scale of the coming disruption. This is both good news and bad news. The bad has less to do with what's coming and more to do with our inability to adapt to change. A slew of studies have shown that the convergence of AI and robotics could threaten a significant percentage of America's workforce over the next few decades. That's tens of millions of people who will have to be retrained and retooled if we hope to keep pace. The good news is what's on the other side of that retraining. Every time a technology goes exponential, we find an internet-sized opportunity tucked inside. Think about the internet itself. While it seemed des while it seemingly decimated industries such as music, media, retail, travel, and taxis, a study by McKinsey Global Research found that the net created 2.6 new jobs for each one it extinguished. Over the next decade, we will see these kinds of opportunities arise in dozens of industries. As a result, if the internet is our benchmark, more wealth could be created over the next 10 years than was over the previous century. Entrepreneurs, including, thankfully, environmentally and socially conscious entrepreneurs, have never had it so good. The time it takes to raise seed capital has shrunk from years to minutes. Unicorn formation, or the time it takes to go from, I've got a neat idea, to, I run a billion dollar company, was once a two decade long shot. Today, in some cases, it's no more than a one year adventure. Unfortunately, established organizations will have a hard time keeping pace. Our biggest companies and government agencies were designed in another century for purposes of safety and stability. Built to last, as the saying goes. But they were not built to withstand rapid, radical change. This is why, according to Yale's Richard Foster, 40% of today's Fortune 500 companies will be gone in 10 years, replaced, for the most part, by startups we've not even heard of yet. Institutions are similarly suffering. The educational system was an 18th century invention designed to batch process children and prepare them for a life working in factories. That's not today's world, which explains why this system is failing to meet our current needs, and is not the only institution under duress. Why are divorce rates so high? One reason is that marriage was created over 4,000 years ago. When we got hitched as teens and death came by 40. The institution was designed for a 20-year maximum commitment, but thanks to advances in healthcare and lifespan, we're now looking at a half century of togetherness, which puts a whole new spin on till death do us part. The point is this. 
being able to see around the corner of tomorrow and being able, being agile enough to adapt to what's coming have never been more important. And in three parts, that's exactly what this book will do. In part one, we will explore 10 technologies currently on exponential growth curves, examining where they are today and where they are going. We'll also assess a series of secondary forces, call them technological shockwaves, and see how they are further accelerating the rate of change in the world and amplifying the scale of its impact. In part two, focusing on nine industries, we'll see how converging technologies are reshaping our world. From the future of education and entertainment to the transformation of healthcare and business, this portion provides a blueprint for tomorrow, a map of the major shift coming to society, and a playbook for anyone interested in surfing that wave. In part three, we move to the bigger picture, looking at a series of environmental, economic, and existential risks that threaten the progress we're about to make. Next, we'll expand our view from the decade ahead to the full century, focusing on five great migrations, economic relocations, climate change upheavals, virtual worlds explorations, outer space coloni colonization, and hive mind collaborations that will play now you see it now you don't with well just about everything but before we do all that as steve jobs like to say wait there's one more thing avatars it's 2028 and you are having breakfast at home in cleveland ohio you stand up kiss the kids goodbye and head out the door today it's a meeting in downtown new york your personal AI knows your schedule, so has an Uber Autonomous on standby. As you walk outside, the self-driving car pulls to your driveway. Time elapsed, less than 10 seconds. Because you're wearing a sleep sensor, and your AI also knows you didn't get much rest last night, it's the perfect opportunity for a cat nap. And your Uber provides nothing less, equipped with a lay-down back seat and a fresh set of sheets. The car bed takes you to a local Hyperloop station where your freshly rested self is transferred into a high-speed pod, then zipped downtown. From the roof of a Cleveland skyscraper, Uber Elevate flies you to one of Manhattan's mega skyports. You take the elevator down to the ground floor, where another Uber Autonomous waits to take you to your meeting on Wall Street. Time elapsed, door-to-door, -door, 59 minutes. To borrow a term from computation, this is a future of packet-switched humans, where you choose your priority speed, comfort, or cost, specify your start and end point, and the system does the rest. No fuss, no missed details, and backup options always available. But wait, there's one more thing. While the technologies we've discussed will decimate the traditional transportation industry, there's something on the horizon that will disrupt travel itself. What if, to get from A to B, you didn't have to move your body? What if you could quote Captain Kirk and just say, Beam me up, Scotty. Well, shy of the, trans the Star Trek transporter, there's the world of avatars. An avatar is a second self, typically in one of two forms. The digital version has been around for a couple of decades. It emerged from the video game industry and was popularized by virtual world sites like Second Life and books turned blockbusters like Ready Player One. A VR headset teleports your eyes and ears to another location, while a, sent, while a set of haptic sensors sifts, shifts your sense of touch. Suddenly, you are inside an avatar inside a virtual world. As you move into the real world, your avatar moves around in the virtual. Use this technology to give a lecture, and you can do it from the comfort of your living room, skipping the trip to the airport, the cross-country flight, and the ride to the conference center. Robots are the second form of avatars. Imagine a humanoid robot that you can occupy at will. Maybe, in a city far from home, you've rented the bot by the minute, via a different kind of ride-sharing company. Or maybe you have spare robot avatars located around the country. Either way, put on your VR goggles and a haptic suit, and you can teleport your senses into that robot. This allows you to walk around, shake hands, and take action, all without having to leave your home. And like the rest of the tech we've talked about, even this future isn't very far away. In 2018, all Nippon Airways, ANA, founded the $10 million ANA Avatar X Prize to speed the development of robotic avatars. Why? 
because ANA knows this is one of the technologies likely to, to disrupt the airline industry, their industry, and they want to be ready. To put this in different terms, individual car ownership enjoyed over a century of ascendancy. The first real threat it faced, today's ride-sharing model, only showed up in the last decade. But that ride-sharing model won't even get 10 years to dominate. Already it's on the brink of autonomous car displacement, which is on the brink of flying car disruption, which is on the brink of Hyperloop and rockets to anywhere decimation. Plus, avatars. The most important part, all of this change will happen over the next 10 years. Welcome to the future that's faster than you think. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.